Uh, well, thank you, Brigitte, and it is wonderful to be here, uh, particularly at such a critical moment in time, and I think Philip did a really good job of highlighting the challenges we face, whether it is population growth, whether it's climate change, uh, global competition. Uh, so I'm going to drill down a little bit uh, at a lower level and share some of the lessons that we learned transforming the streets uh, of New York City. But before I get started, I want to get a sense, how many of you have been to New York City in the last five years? Huh. That's great. How many of you have been to New York City in the last two years? Okay. Uh, last year? All right, well, our tourism package is definitely working. <laughs> so those of you that have been to New York City know just how big a change there's been on the streets in the last uh, five to seven years. And uh, for those of you who have not been, the two of you that have not been to New York City, uh, consider this to be your official uh, invitation. But in just a few years, New Yorkers have actually become fluent in an entirely new language of sustainable streets. They talk easily about protected bike lanes, they talk about pedestrian plazas, they talk about bike sharing, and I think in a very short time, our mean streets, our famous mean streets, have become much nicer uh, in a very short time. And like you, uh, we have lots of infrastructure to play with in New York City. There's 6,000 miles of streets, there's 789 bridges, 12,000 signalized intersections, and we run one of the largest passenger ferry operations in the United States. So this is not a Portland story. This is a story about a big city that has a lot of lessons for cities uh, of all sizes. And as the cultural and economic capital of Norway, you know something about managing people uh, and infrastructure here in Oslo. I mean, this city is over a thousand years old, which makes us look like pikers, uh, and you are used to tackling uh, big things. Uh, with much more to come, uh, since you're one of the fastest growing, if not the fastest growing region uh, in Europe. But as we've all seen, it takes a lot of hard work to get beyond the kind of dashboard view uh, of our road, for beyond the windshield, uh, which is the view that we've had for so long. And for many years, city leaders looked at a picture like this and they said, yep, everything's working just fine. And it's actually hard to remember that our streets weren't always like this. They were actually shared spaces. They were extensions of our living rooms, uh, of our storefronts. Uh, this is actually uh, Lower Manhattan in 1900. And it really wasn't that much different here. But the shift to the automobile didn't just happen magically. Uh, it actually happened by design. As you can see, these are planning documents uh, from, uh, New for New York City from 1922. I love this diagram because the first step, pedestrians are removed. <laughs> Excellent. Second step, cars invade. So it's sort of like Venice, uh, but with traffic sewers instead of canals. And by the 1920s, it was actually hard to imagine even crossing the street in places like uh, here in Brooklyn at Grand Army Plaza. And it really only got much worse from there. Industrial design from Detroit became the main consideration in shaping cities and streets around the world. And automobile makers spent much of the 20th century convincing us that we had this love affair with the automobile. And in fact, I really think it was more of an arranged marriage. <laughs> and this worldview really focused on moving as many cars as possible from point A to point B and lost all of the other ways that a street is used. Uh, this is Times Square in 1950. And you know, over 60 years later, not much had changed. This was before our redesign of Times Square. And when you think about it, our streets have been in a kind of uh, suspended animation for years. And you think about the changes that we've all gone through, the cultural, social, economic changes. Think about the technology changes that have happened in the last several years. And yet we're still kind of stuck with this, you know, uh, dial-up connection on our streets. 
you know, nothing really new. And uh, what we ended up doing was, uh, thanks to Mayor Bloomberg, we ended up uh, shattering the status quo that we saw on our streets. And his long-range sustainability plan, called Plan YC, recognize that if we're going to continue to grow and thrive in the years and decades ahead uh, and accommodate the million more people that are expected to come to New York by 2030, uh, we needed to change the way that we did business and to work towards the streets that we actually wanted and not just the stone age system uh, that we'd actually inherited. But to make real change, you need leaders with vision, uh, with courage uh, and commitment like Ellen, like Borid, like Opal the Hansen. And you cannot change the big ship of a city if you do not have uh, a plan to get there. And so one of the very first things that we did at New York City DOT was to create a strategic plan, uh, which was basically a new roadmap for our streets. And our strategies focused on making our streets better for walking, uh, to make it easier to get around the city by bike, uh, to make it faster and more convenient uh, to take the bus. Now, these ideas are not new, but what was really new was the speed with which we delivered these programs. New Yorkers, I don't know how it is here, but New Yorkers actually had gotten to the point where they actually didn't believe that it was possible to change the streets uh, of New York City. I mean, you all are moving forward with a really robust transit program. We are on our fourth groundbreaking of just one transit line. So people had really almost given up that our streets could uh, change. So we moved really fast with just paint and planters and stones. We changed our streets in real time. And the proof of concept wasn't just a computer model, but it was actually real world performance. And it's an important idea because what it does is it allows you to change the use of a space and you can always put it back if it doesn't work. You know, people can't argue that our streets are working so perfectly that they can never change. And so the idea of showing the world of the possible but uh, being able to adapt it and, and, and put it back if it doesn't work is a very important idea. And we did these quick changes to make the ideas in our long-range sustainability plan, Mayor Bloomberg's uh, plan YC, a tangible reality for New Yorkers. We did this plaza in Brooklyn over a weekend. We just painted it green, striped the curb, put out the table and chairs, and it was real-time transformation. We did this all over the city. This, this is in uh, Lower Manhattan in the financial district. Since all of you have been there, you've seen this. Uh, we have very narrow streets in Lower Manhattan, and so there was not a lot, a lot of space for cafes. So we created these pop-up uh, cafes. And we did it in places like Madison Square, which is famous for its iconic Flatiron building, but it's also famous for the widest intersection uh, in New York City. And we changed it, and it was interesting. Even when we put out the orange barrels, just to mark out where we were gonna change the space, people came to that space like it was a Star Trek episode. They just, whoop, they came out of nowhere. I don't know what they were doing before, but they came. And this art class was there like an hour after we put out the orange barrels. So New Yorkers are hungry. And uh, today, this is one of the most popular plazas in New York City. And it's so interesting to me because people will sit, there's a park over there, you know, this beautiful park, Madison Square Park, but people choose to sit in the plaza right in the middle of the traffic, you know, just to feel the energy and the pulse uh, of the city. So, uh, these new public spaces uh, are in big demand all around the city. We did it all around the city, not just Manhattan. This is in Queens. Uh, and we really worked hard to create safer uh, uh, crossings. Uh, this is the foot of the uh, Williamsburg Bridge. Um, and we just organized it so it worked better for everywhere. And in, 60 year, in, in six years, we created 60 plazas in every borough uh, of the city. And you can see this on the map. Uh, we use different partnership models to take care and maintain uh, the spaces, and we can talk about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, but the program was designed so that after marking out the plaza with temporary materials, uh, these programs also went through our formal construction program. Um, in New York City, it takes about five years to get through the construction program, so it was really important that we could show how you could change the use and the experience of a street uh, quickly. 
And the program went well beyond creating plazas. It was really about creating a new, new road order on our streets and providing acres of new space uh, for residents and tourists and workers uh, down to the shops. And you can see how quickly, just with striping, uh, you can make a difference. I remember when we did this, uh, I was, uh, uh, the very first day we, we did it, um, I, I was sitting there walking through the project with the New York Times reporter. And so, of course, the Times reporter picks somebody who looks like they will not like the plaza. And so uh, the guy, uh, he interviews the, the guy that's standing there, and he says, well, you know, this is a disaster. Nobody is going to use this space. Nobody's going to eat their tuna fish sandwich, you know, sitting in the middle of traffic. And so, you know, the Times reporter writes this all down. And uh, about two minutes later, you know, you saw the construction worker sitting down, eating his lunch, you know, happy, uh, in the plaza. And so it really is, uh, it doesn't take a lot to actually um, create these better streets. And in, in project after project, it became clear that better streets are better for business. This is outside of Macy's, and we took this traffic-choked uh, artery of Broadway and created this kind of miracle on 34th Street. Pedestrian foot traffic went up 6% just in the first six months uh, of the project. Probably our, our biggest example of this was what we did in Times Square. And in Times Square, as, as you know, uh, before we did the project, 90% of the people that were going through Times Square were on foot. And yet they only had 10% of the space. And we're talking about 354,000 people a day walking through uh, Times Square. And so people were trading the safety of the sidewalk for the street. So what would happen is, you know, you would come with your family, and you'd be walking through Times Square, and me, as a New Yorker, I'd be standing behind you, and you'd be walking four abreast, and I would start to go crazy, because I can't get around you. And so that's, I would dart into the street, and New Yorkers really like to get around fast, you know, New York Minute, that's what we really like to do. And so it's interesting how when you actually uh, give the space for the people that use it and want it, the, the miracle that can happen with that. So, you know, we actually announced this as a pilot program to test it out. Mayor Bloomberg, uh, I pitched it to him in 2009, uh, I, I, and, you know, he didn't really blink. Well, he, he sort of blinked. He said, you want to do what? <laughs> and, uh, and it was incredible. He, he agreed that we would do it, but we would monitor the results. We would uh, analyze how it worked from a safety perspective, a mobility perspective, an economic development perspective. And if it worked, we'd keep it, and if it didn't work, uh, we would put it back. His line was, in God we trust, and everyone else bring data. <laughs> so we brought lots and lots of data. And we made it clear that we would put it back if it didn't work. And this went a long way to reducing the anxiety uh, of the program. People were, you know, more uh, ready to uh, try it out if they knew that it could go back from the, from the way it was. But like any major project, there are surprises along the way. So when we did this, when we put out the orange cones, we're so excited, we're about to, you know, launch Times Square. And then we realized we didn't have anything in the plaza itself. It was like two and a half acres. Uh, of public space, but nothing in there. So what were we going to do? This was like the night before. So working with Tim Tompkins, who is the head of the uh, Times Square Alliance, we went to a discount hardware store, and we bought beach chairs. <laughs> and we put beach chairs all over Times Square. And I have to tell you, everybody in the morning talked about the beach chairs. right? They talked about the color of the beach chairs. Do you like the feel of the beach chairs? But people did not talk about the fact that we'd closed Broadway to cars. So I know you have a lot of big projects going on here. So, you know, if you get into trouble, beach chairs. Just put out beach chairs. So it became this big success, you know, and you can see these beach chairs here. Uh, people came out and they became this new symbol of Times Square. There was even a t-shirt that was like, I, beach chair, New York. Uh, and they were used day and night, all sorts of performances, uh, and there were huge uh, safety benefits, uh, economic benefits. 80% fewer people were walking in the street, uh, and which brought injuries down, and that's a huge thing. I mean, 
You know, New Yorkers are crazy, as I said, about this space. You know, we really need to be able to get by. In fact, in one of the first year when I was transportation commissioner, actually a group of uh, uh, artists, guerrilla artists, went to Fifth Avenue, and they dressed up in New York City DOT hats and vests and, you know, buckets, and they striped down the middle of Fifth Avenue, down the sidewalk, but did a big stripe. And on one hand, they painted visitors, and the other hand, they painted New Yorkers. <laughs> and New Yorkers followed it. Everybody followed it. In fact, people thought that was a great idea. <laughs> so these kinds of projects you know, provide much safer uh, streets. We saw motor motorist injuries go down 63%, even as travel times remained uh, the same in Midtown. And it was a huge economic uh, blockbuster. We had six new stores move in. Uh, it became one of the top 10 retail locations on the planet. Uh, in the center there, that's Lady Gaga uh, opening up uh, Times Square. So that's where the rock star thing comes in, you know, transportation and rock stars. We just uh, recruit them. And uh, aside from the mayor, uh, the BID, the Business Improvement District, was really an incredible uh, ally for us. And um, we got the landlords on board as well and did some really smart programming. This is yoga. Uh, in Times Square. Uh, we did a lot of volunteer projects. Uh, we did a lot of open air opera uh, projects. And this is the evolution, and it's important to remember how quickly we did this, from this scene of endless asphalt uh, to a thriving plaza uh, with these temporary materials. And now we are looking at the permanent construction, which is opening up in phases. And it's been this huge success with New Yorkers who before would not have been caught dead uh, in Times Square. And I really can't say enough about the work that Snohetta did. Uh, uh, I know they're, they're based here and I know Tanja is here and they have just did an incredible uh, work bringing an incredible design palette uh, to uh, Times Square. In fact, these uh, pavers look like the pavers on the, on the waterfront that you have uh, in Oslo that Ellen showed us yesterday. And they're studded with these little studs which reflect uh, the lights of the billboards, and it creates this great new energy of the street. And it really just remade this uh, image of New York. And I actually have uh, one of the beach chairs uh, still in my office today. It's my little piece of history. Um, and so when you come, uh, this is what you'll see. This is the final reconstruction. And you're seeing these kinds of new approaches everywhere. Uh, in places like Los Angeles, the, the car-centric capital of the United States, and they've transformed uh, in front of their famous uh, central city market, uh, completing the, creating these new pedestrian oases. Um, and uh, you're seeing you know, new pedestrian plazas in Philadelphia. You're seeing the same kind of work uh, in Buenos Aires uh, or in Auckland. This is the heart of Mexico City. So you can see this language of sustainable streets is universal. And this blue, new blueprint for cities is also about building in more ways for people to get around. And people are not going to walk or bike uh, unless they feel safe doing so. So in that sense, safety and sustainability uh, go hand in hand. And this is especially important when you are uh, biking. And if you create a safer infrastructure, people will bike. So we took streets like these, that basically the message of the street was bike at your own risk. And we transformed them uh, into these. And these projects have a dramatic impact that goes well beyond the bike lane. Uh, where we put in protected bike paths, we saw uh, injuries go down 50% on the street for all users, not just cyclists, but also for drivers uh, and pedestrians, and retail uh, sales went up 50%. So all the businesses along the protected bike route saw their sales increase 50%. So these projects are not, uh, they are an incredible part of an economic development strategy for the city. And we created this ex extensive set of designs uh, to work in different situations. And so where we didn't have enough room for a protected bike lane, we would stripe uh, a green high visibility lane. Uh, on wider streets, of course, we did put in these protected bike lanes. We also put in two-way lanes to connect uh, the network. So you, you never came off the network without having um, a smooth connection. And 
all across the city, we took advantage of the infrastructure that we had, whether it was medians that we could create uh, or uh, taking streets that were kind of the Wild West. This is First Avenue. This is one of my favorite projects. It's like the Wild West, you know, this north-south uh, street that goes across, uh, 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 transverses uh, Manhattan. And it went from this to this. So I love this. This makes me so happy to do. <laughs> Actually, this is one of my favorite uh, uh, moments in time, uh, was when we launched our bike share program, and I was, uh, Alexander knows this story, I was um, riding the bike, the very first bike, and I'm riding up, and I'm in this protected lane, and I'm being protected by the bikes, by the parked cars that are there, which was an idea that I got from Copenhagen, and the cars are moving, and there are three lanes of dedicated traffic, and then you have the bus, and it's moving up the bus lane, and it's, Birds are singing and rainbows are going and it was just like incredible, you know. So, I'm getting carried away. Uh, so, and with that, we also saw uh, uh, crashes go down 40% and biking doubled. Um, now, there were bumps in the road. This was not all, you know, just voila, here's your new streetscape. Um, uh, when you push the status quo, and I know you know that here, when you take away a parking space, you know, it can be controversial. And the status quo definitely pushes back. Probably ground zero for the pushback was something called Prospect Park West. This is a park uh, in Brooklyn. And um, the community had asked us to fix it. It was a very dangerous speedway. Cars would zoom uh, up Prospect Park West. It was like a jetway, you know, these, they were like planes zooming through and very, very dangerous corridor. So they asked us to fix it. So what we did was we put in this protected bike lane, two-way bike lane, and, and the number of speeding went, uh, cars speeding went down 75%. Um, people were not uh, riding on the sidewalk anymore. But it became this political football, the, just this. Uh, one Brooklyn paper called it the most contested slab of concrete outside the Gaza Strip. <laughs> now, uh, we do get a little excited in New York, but that was, uh, that was really kind of captured it for me. But the success of this project far outlasted the headlines. And one of the most common complaints I got when we were changing the streets was that if you put more cyclists on the street, you're going to have much more dangerous streets. There are going to be many, many more accidents. And in fact, the op opposite was true. As you can see here, you, um, you know, more bike lanes, more cyclists, uh, the safer your streets are. So if you want a safer city, build bike lanes. So in seven years, under seven years, we built 400 miles of on-street bike lanes. And we connected uh, our bridges and put together a real biking backbone for, for New York City. So we went from this to this. This to this. So easy when you do it on the computer. Uh, and I can't really say enough about the advocates who really supported our work, whether it was the community advocates like Eric McClure up there uh, on the top left who came out and did rallies uh, in support of uh, Prospect Park West or Transportation Alternatives, our local bike advocacy community that really helped on the push for safer streets with more bike lanes, uh, our council members and legislative leaders um, and, and uh, uh, some of the uh, progressive press went a very long way uh, to helping us uh, work through these changes. And it was interesting, you know, we found at the end of the day that the people were far ahead of the press and far ahead of the politicians. In fact, these are the statistics at the end of the Bloomberg administration, and you can see 73% support, 73 support for bike share. You see 72% support for pedestrian plazas and 64% uh, for our uh, bike lanes. You know, if the bike lanes were running for office, it would be a landslide. <laughs> so uh, today, city planners around the world are actually adopting these tools for their own streets. And you see this in places like Atlanta here, uh, to Denver, to Indianapolis, which has become a kind of biking capital for the Midwest, uh, Pittsburgh, Austin, Seattle, Vancouver, London, Lima, Stockholm, and right here at home. I think all these cities are showing that 
biking and walking and transit can play well together if you don't force them to fight over the scraps. And I think the city's new 10-year master plan could be the master stroke creating a new road order for Oslo. And for New York City, a big part of our new road order was the launch of our bike share system. Um, this is another one of my favorite pictures because it's one of the few pictures where I'm standing next to the mayor and smiling because in almost all of the rest of the pictures, I'm standing behind the mayor like this, just praying that it works. <laughs> and fortunately, uh, it did. And uh, it's been a big success, 15 million trips taken, 25 million rides. Um, and a big reason for the success of the program was the station siting uh, process. Over 65,000 New Yorkers actually uh, went on to our online portal and, and said where they wanted these stations to be. Uh, and the key was the proximity to transit, which made a huge difference. Uh, and now we've got 7,000 bikes and 330 stations, and we're expanding to 10,000 bikes uh, at the end of the year. And it really went a long way to kind of changing who's biking. You know, because in the past, it would be this like lycra-clad kind of ninja biker, right? This kind of messenger that would go racing through the streets. And now this is more the typical, you know, cyclist, which also goes a long way to getting the buy-in when everybody uh, is cycling. And you know something about this here. You have one of the oldest modern bike share systems uh, in the world. Uh, but I think the challenge is to keep improving it. Uh, to ensure that the network is dense enough with enough stations, uh, that you're rebalancing it, that it's convenient, that you're serving uh, low-income neighborhoods. Uh, I think that any city that's building a world-class bike share system needs to answer uh, these questions. But for all of the headlines, it's easy to forget that investment in bike and pedestrian infrastructure is one of the most cost-effective investments that you can make. In New York, it was less than 1% of our capital budget. You know, it was about 99% of our press coverage, but it was 1% of our, of our money. And these are projects that you know, any city, large or small, can afford to tackle. And in fact, I think uh, no city can afford not to tackle uh, them. And you know, I would say that it certainly compares well to the uh, 5.4 billion uh, to widen the E18 roadway. Because the fact is we are not going to build our way out of congestion just by laying out new roads. Um, we have to make the ones that we have work more efficiently. And that's what we did with our select bus uh, service program, which was you know, New York's version of bus rapid transit. Um, it was really nothing fancy. We did off-board fare collection, uh, bus-only lanes that were enforced uh, by cameras, you know, three-door boarding. And the results were um, impressive. Travel times uh, were reduced by 10%. And at a time when bus ridership was going down, we saw uh, that uh, ridership went up by 10%. So it's important to show that it can be done, right? that we can make changes. Because you know, in New York, we have the largest uh, bus fleet in North America, but we have the slowest speeds. And so my traffic engineer uh, used to say, I love this line, he would say that the only way to get across town was to be born there. <laughs> so that's not really the mark of a uh, world-class city. And so we rolled out seven lines uh, in six years across five boroughs uh, in parts of the city that hadn't seen transit improvement uh, in decades. And just like our plaza and our bike lanes, um, more riders uh, and more foot traffic uh, and more uh, was also a huge success on our first uh, bus line, the, the uh, BX12. We saw a 71% increase uh, in retail sales when we put this new bus lane in uh, in the Bronx. And I think it puts a, a few more holes in this myth that free parking and traffic lanes are the drivers of economic growth. Um, cars don't shop in stores and restaurants. People do. So these projects also, I think if we're going to create inviting streetscapes for people to encourage them to walk, um, these projects can't stop at the curb. And we need to create streets that are friendly and have a beautiful uh, design aesthetic. And they should look like somebody uh, cared for them. And you can see that now. Uh, these are our new bus shelters. 
Uh, we've also done that with our new bike parking designs and our newsstands and benches. Uh, a few years ago, we found that you know, New York was a great walking city, but there were very few places to sit down. You probably saw that when you were there. And so uh, it's kind of an oxymoron, great walking city, no place to sit down. Um, and people would just sit anywhere. You, know, you saw them sit on trash cans, on fire hydrants. You know, it was just not great for families with kids, uh, not great for, for people that are looking to take a load off. And that changed, and we uh, put 1,000 new city benches uh, throughout the city. We also launched a design competition uh, for be uh, our new uh, bike uh, racks, which you know, before they looked like some kind of crazy plumber had just plopped them down on the streets. Uh, and so uh, that was a, a great new addition. And we also worked to improve how uh, you can get around the streets with a new wayfinding system. We'd also done another survey, uh, and we found that at any point in time, 10% of New Yorkers were lost. You may have asked you know, questions about where to go from one of those 10% that were lost. You know, and that's just the 10% that would admit that they were lost. So. Obviously, the need was there, and so we created this comprehensive uh, system, uh, and we showed the time that it would take, you know, five-minute walk radius, 10-minute walk radius, uh, to get there. And it's part of this comprehensive set of signs that we did that can be tailored to any size street uh, in the city, and it has the same design vocabulary as our uh, bike shelters, our bus shelters, and um, bike share. And we also put real-time information uh, on these SBS routes, and um, as we're getting close to close, I want to highlight that with 6,000 miles of streets and 12,000 miles of sidewalks, we really have the biggest open-air gallery you know, in, uh, in the world. And we looked at our streets as showcases for local artists. And we partnered with them to bring new life uh, to these plazas with sculptures. And um, we also created opportunities for New Yorkers to see their streets in new ways. Um, how many of you have been and done the Summer Streets program in New York in, in August? You're probably on vacation here in August. But when you come in August, you'll see we close the streets seven miles, Brooklyn Bridge to uh, Central Park, uh, car-free streets. We program it. You can take kickboxing, dancing, yoga, cha-cha, whatever. I took a kickboxing class with the deputy mayor that I reported to. I have to tell you, it was very cathartic. I liked it. Um, uh, and you can have some fun along the way. Um, we did things like zip lines, uh, we did pop-up pools, uh, these were dumpsters that we obviously cleaned, um, and people swam in the shadow of Grand Central. We also played with the canvas of our bridges with uh, art installations, even uh, Jersey barriers, generic metal fences around our construction sites, and we uh, cr just enlivened the neighborhood wherever we could. We commissioned artists to take our streets in new directions. This is actually Molly Dilworth's it's a heat signature map of Times Square translated into color. And a big part of this new road order is measuring the impact uh, of, uh, of our work. And so one of our first uh, big uh, analysis projects was this pedestrian safety and action plan. And it was the largest ever done in the United States. We took a deep dive into 7,000 crashes uh, that we'd seen over a four-year period in the, in the city. And it became our kind of Rosetta Stone uh, for safety, the who, what, when, where, and why of these traffic crashes. And that's what we used to target where we made changes on the streets. And our goal was to reduce traffic fatalities uh, by 50%. You know, and, and cities have now moved on to Vision Zero. So you know, this was the first time that a city had actually committed to a number. And it uh, really helps steer public attitudes uh, for safety and traffic violence. And we took a page out of your book uh, with Vision Zero, which is now uh, being copied all over the world. Uh, this is a map of our uh, interventions uh, across the city. Great results, the lowest traffic fatalities in 100 years since we started keeping records. But we didn't stop at safety. We also measured the economic impact of our investments. And we used new metrics to see uh, what happened, and you can, uh, I encourage you to find it, it's all online. Uh, and importantly, these new strategies did not hurt traffic flow. We actually uh, uh, better matched our traffic signals to real-time traffic conditions, 
And so we were actually able to improve the throughput uh, on our streets. And we got the data from my data-driven mayor from uh, 13,000 yellow cabs, which all have uh, GPS devices in them. So in city after city, um, you've seen these uh, results. Uh, merchants often overestimate the number of customers that are coming to their stores uh, by parking, and they overvalue parking. Heavy traffic does not equal heavy commerce. Um, you're seeing these impacts in Seattle. You're seeing them in Auckland. You're seeing the same thing in Melbourne. And so, you know, when it comes to cyclists, there's safety in numbers, as we've talked about, but there's also uh, plenty of spending money, too. These uh, strategies have been adopted as formal policy at New York City DOT. Um, they've been adopted uh, across the United States uh, through NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, which is an organization that I uh, chair. And it actually provided a new permission slip for cities to innovate because the design standards didn't match what we wanted to do on the streets. So we're now creating a new global street design guide. So I encourage any of you that are interested in that uh, participating in that. We're, we're doing the peer review now, and I would love to have uh, your input on that. This is the core of the new vision. It puts people on two feet and two wheels uh, above cars, flips the hierarchy on its head. It takes designs like these and builds in better balance and mobility and safety. And I have to say, I had the pleasure of biking through Oslo with Ellen and Brigitte and Stein, and you know, I saw the great uh, bones that this city has, you know? I mean, you all have great bones, of course, because you're Scandinavian, but the, your city has great bones. You know, you see the, the waterfront and the vibrant neighborhoods, um, and you really have the foundation for a world-class, uh, bikeable, walkable, transit-rich future, and I think you can build on that uh, to create uh, an even better future. Um, the way that you design your streets and public spaces says so much about who you are. And it's exciting to see some of the bold plans uh, for the city with the upgrade to the region's uh, mass transit network, uh, to the new railway uh, tunnels in the center of the city, the redevelopment of the Oslo Central Station. And you know, some may balk at the cost or the wisdom of these strategies, but I think that mindset of despair uh, is a result of status quo thinking. And we really need to break this cycle of wasted opportunity. Because these projects are not just nice to have. They are critical economic development strategies and critical to the quality of life in this city. And now is the time to try new things, to be bold, to tap into the hidden energy that is on your streets. And you can create a new future for Drammen and for Oslo and for the region. And you can reinvent your cities from the street up. You have the vision, you have the uh, leadership, and I think with the energy of everyone in this room, you can make it happen. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jeanette, for this yeah, I'll say mind-blowing presentation, or maybe a myth buster. <laughs> there we go, that's better. <laughs> I'd also like to ask you one question, or maybe two. Uh, with all this evidence, why is it that this myth of business being dependent on car parking at the very doorstep of the shops mm. is so extremely long-lived? I mean, is it because uh, did they refuse to take in the facts? These guys run the businesses and the politicians? Or are they maybe somewhat slow? Or <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching that last part. But I will say that I think that part of the piece is the status quo. We've looked at our streets as being sort of immovable. They're going to be the same way, you know, that's the way they function, and that's the way they're designed. And people don't think that they can be used any differently. And so, you know, the data was actually a very important part of convincing the business community that these are smart strategies, that they're good for business, you know, they're good for money in your pocket. Because people, you know, you take away a parking space and people get really upset. They think that their business is going to go downhill. And in fact, the opposite is true because when you're cycling and when you're walking, it's easy to step into a store. You know, it's easy to see, oh, that's a cool new place I'd like to go. 
And so that's increasingly, I think people are starting to understand it, which is why I think you're seeing mayors around the world and cities around the world adopting these new strategies because they understand that in this global marketplace, people can move anywhere, companies can move anywhere. And so the quality of life of our cities is critical to their economic development and these strategies are a critical down payment on, on getting there. We're actually going to have a, there is like an experiment in Oslo coming up this year where we ask volunteering shops if, if we can replace the parking sites outside the shop with six parking spaces for cycles. Oh, that's it's, been great. A, it's coming up this summer, and yeah. uh, it seems like a lot of shops, or shop owners, actually, yeah, they would like to take part in this. Well, right. it's interesting, because yeah. in New York, we actually took our programs, you know, which we kind of showcased them, um, but then we turned the programs into application-based programs, so communities would apply to us for a plaza or a bike lane or a bus lane. And what happened over the five-year period of time is now the demand is off the charts. So business communities, you know, uh, local neighborhoods are all now demanding mm. bus rapid transit and demanding these pedestrian plazas and strategies. So it flips the relationship that we have with government. Instead of government sort of pushing it on communities, communities are demanding it now that they know what to ask for. Okay, thank you very much, Jeanette.